different recipes in the global context. And uh, as he comes to the stage, I'd like also to thank the Russell Barry Foundation that allowed us to have Professor Spence with us here today. Please. Son says, I can't see you, but I hope you can see me. Um, I, I'm very, very pleased to be here. It's an honor uh, to be part of this very exciting process. And I think my assignment this morning is to share some experiences in the developing world and in, in the global community generally that are, I think you'll find are supportive of, uh, of what you're about to embark on today. Obviously, what's important. Um, in the next two days is what you're going to be doing, and, uh, and I'm going to try uh, to suggest that, that what you're embarked on is, is actually a very important foundation of uh, building the future of the country. Um, I think the Rare Institute and the Marker deserve a great deal of praise uh, for taking this on. Um, it's, it's an important agenda, the longer-term agenda. It does tend to get crowded out. Uh, the longer term social and economic agenda, and, uh, and, and so I'm delighted uh, to be part of this. I, I also think that the research agenda, the Root Institute, um, which involves learning uh, from the experiences of other countries, can be very useful and a terribly important input. Uh, but having said that, uh, this notion of uh, ingredients and recipes and so on, uh, cooking, <laughs> is actually due to my colleague on the Growth Commission and, and Stan Fisher's uh, old colleague at, at MIT, Robert Soule. He's a great man and the father of modern growth theory. And one of the things we agree on on the Commission is that while there are some common ingredients, uh, at least across the developing countries, but I think more broadly, um, all the edible recipes that get concocted our country context and time specific. The world just changes. Uh, the country evolves, the country has specific institutions and so on, and, and you can't do this unless you're doing it with the people who have general knowledge uh, of those institutions, history, and, and, and uh, contextual matters. The other thing I want to talk about today at the end, very briefly, is that the global economy is evolving very rapidly, and that presents opportunities and challenges, including in the advanced countries like this one. And in my view, uh, the formulation of long-term objectives and, and strategies and policies to su support the achievement of those objectives simply requires, it's crucial, to have an understanding, a working knowledge of what's going on in the rest of the global economy because it is impactful in an increasingly important and complex way. Let me drop back and talk a little bit about these uh, developing countries that are now such an important part of the global economy. We found there were 13 high growth countries defined as countries that had managed to grow at 7% or more uh, in real terms for 25 years or more. That's the kind of sustained growth that's transformative. I think that group is about to be expanded, uh, uh, probably almost certainly by India and Vietnam. And they have some shared characteristics. First, they find a way, regardless of their form of governance, be democratic, somewhat more autocratic, dominant single party, to have long time horizons. That's not easy, but the process you're involved in is part of creating the the longer term sort of frame of reference for the formulation of policy in public sector investment. They have what economists would call low revealed social discount rates, which means they care about the future and they invest heavily at some considerable sacrifice in order to make sure, as Guy Rolnick said, that their children and grandchildren have an opportunity set that is not diminished and in most cases is expanded relative to what they and their uh, predecessors experience. They reach somehow in the context of something like what you're about to embark on, agreement on objectives, and usually that includes a focus on inclusive growth. 
and an in inclusiveness, at least in the minds of the members of the Growth Commission, political and policy leaders from all over the developing world, is crucial. It's not an add-on. It's an inherent part of all, as far as we can tell, successful growth strategies. Um, <coughs> these terms are, the terms are, are different in different contexts. The Europeans use the term social cohesion. In America, to talk about this kind of thing, we talk about the social contract. They're actually di slightly different as you go from one country to another, what we would call a social contract. But whatever it is, um, it's important because it's what people believe in, and it has to be consistent with the way the state and the society and the economy behaves and throws up opportunity, or doesn't. Um, in the successful developing countries, there is always an ongoing debate about strategy and policy that's inclusive, again, regardless of the form of political organization. Um, and that is what creates uh, the sense of shared direction. It's also what corrects major errors on the way through. The engagement of the government is a very important part of this. It's not enough just to have a debate and a sharing of values and priorities. It, there has to be some reason to believe that it will come together somewhere. So the government's engagement in this process is important. Many people in the West do not understand what are called five-year plans in the developing countries. They used to be plans, as in centrally planned economy. They aren't plans anymore. What they are is the outcome of what you are about to embark on here. That is priorities, a sense of direction, and something that brings it together so it has a, has a kind of coherence. The Israeli economy is uh, an impressive economy. It's advanced economically, technologically, and in terms, especially in terms of human capital. Um, it has an impressive development record, especially when you take into account the resources that have had to go into security for the state. Per capita income, as you know, is about $30,000. The rank uh, is about somewhere between 25 and 30, slightly less if you make purchasing power parity adjustments, which are quite large in some countries. Um, it's very advanced in terms of technology and human capital. It's a small country, and therefore economically specialized, uh, open economy, $200 billion, roughly, of GDP, and, um, and a trade exposure, exports and imports, as a fraction of GDP on the order of 80%. Not uncommon for a small, open, dynamic economy. The growth has been substantial. The population growth is also relatively high by advanced country standards, so the per capita income has not risen at a level yet that would give rise in the future, if you project it forward, to a sort of major uh, change in sort of rank, position, and wealth. Um, I must say, although I don't like the idea, that the very likely slow growth in much of the advanced country world may help you make this jump, <laughs> but that's not the right way for it to occur. I do want to draw your attention to income distribution issues. Some of these numbers may not be familiar to you, and I don't mean to harp on them. The standard measure of income inequality is uh, the Gini coefficient. Uh, I've put them in as running from 0 to 100. You can think of them as running from 0 to 1. Israel's in the sort of upper end of the middle range uh, at, with a Gini coefficient of 39.2. The United States is somewhere between 41 and 45, right around a tie with China. And, and, and the numbers on the right-hand side of this graph, which you can look at later, are the ratio of the top 10% to the bottom 10% income and then the ratio of the top 20% to the bottom 20%. The European economies tend to be lower, as you can see on the graph. Then there are the economies that, for reasons I don't have time to go into, in Latin America and to some extent in Africa, that have very high Gini coefficients, which I assure you are a problem. Uh, they give rise to pol um, polarized politics and lots of bad stuff. And I put India at the bottom. The reason I mention this is that I think that in order to achieve a major change, view that from an economic point of view, 
one of the best places to focus is raising the incomes and thinking about what needs to happen on the supply uh, side of the economy and the demand side in terms of jobs to raise the incomes of the middle range. I'm reasonably sure that Israel looks like the United States and a number of other advanced countries, and the upper income range is doing just fine. Thank you. Uh, and that the big opportunity lies in the middle range where, I'll argue in a minute, the global economy is having the tendency because of the massive size now of the emerging economies of compressing the employment opportunities and even the incomes in that sector. Um, <coughs> one thing I want to emphasize, uh, and I hope it's part of your discussion, is that I don't know why that thing's there. Oh, it's on my screen, but it's not yours. Um, is that economic growth requires structural change in the economy. We learned that it's, it's, it's transparently clear in the emerging economies with people flowing into urban centers, entering the modern part of the economy with the export sector expanding and diversifying, but it's true of all economies. Uh, this is what, this is, and it's uncomfortable. Structural change means change. It's uncomfortable. And I refer you to um, two pieces of work. One is quite old, but important, and that is a, a book by Michael Porter, called The Competitive Advantage of Nations, which discusses the location of industrial activity in the global economy. And what he discovered is something I think we now know, which is there are pockets of excellence. Um, there are clusters of truly competitive industrial activity in most global industries. And some part of one way to think about the challenge is to make sure you have an adequate set of clusters of uh, things that are competitive from a global point of view in the tradable sector. Lessons from the emerging economies, I think they're relatively straightforward. Um, the recipes are not ingredients or lists of things to do. Um, there's no one-size-fits-all formula. Recipes are more like strategies. They have to be coherent. Um, they have some common ingredients. Openness to the global economy and leveraging it its um, markets and its knowledge base and technology is one, um, hence the term catch-up growth. High levels of public and private sector investment are both important, and the role of the government, I think, is also clear. In economic terms, the role of the government is to create an environment in which private sector investment is attractive and the returns, risk-adjusted returns, are high. That is, the proximate driver of growth is private sector, entrepreneurship and investment, and the government, which has an important role to play, is to create the tangible and intangible assets, infrastructure, human capital, institutions, and technology that raise the return to that private sector investment. Of course, part of that is competent economic macro management. Without it, you get instability, rising risk in the investment side, and poor performance. Um, I don't know if I want to spend too much time on this, but, uh, but the reason the political systems matter in this and, and the complexity uh, in formulating sort of growth and development, social and economic development strategies, lies in things that have to do with politics, political feasibility, uh, sequencing of things so that people feel that they're getting better off and not getting left out. Um, you have to accept market incentives and decentralization and price signals, um, but you have to accept also that the government and ultimately the citizenry have to, to make key um, choices uh, if one is going to have a viable long-term agenda. I think leadership is crucial. It's very hard to define, uh, but there is a process. If you're going to have a long-time horizon and this coming together of the, the uh, elite, uh, the people who are engaged in thinking about the future of the economy, and if it's going to come together somewhere, it has to come together in the form of something that's understandable. If you can call it a plan, you can call it a consensus, you can call it whatever, but it takes work to build it. This is what political leaders do. They bring stakeholders from business, labor, the civil society organizations, and so on together and create a vision 
which is the basis for formulating strategies and policies. I think it has to have a credible commitment to inclusiveness. It has to be a workable economic model, meaning strategy. Um, and it has to, and its importance is associated with the fact that it acts as a counterweight um, to the rather powerful short-termism incentives that you find especially in democratic structures. That's not a criticism of democratic structures. It just means that, that political leadership and ultimately citizen engagement in the longer-term agendas are crucial to overcome some of these other forces. I think intent matters. It's not good enough to get the policies right. That is a kind of orthodoxy sound to it. What matters is setting goals, admitting that you don't know how to get to them exactly, and experimenting your way forward until you achieve them, uh, with lots of false starts on the way. In that context, persistence, pragmatism, a problem-solving orientation, all have very high payoffs. I want to say this again. This is, these kinds of things are things for which we do not know all the answers and do not have formulae, notwithstanding what some people say about it. And so it's, I think of it as sort of navigating with incomplete charts on a very long voyage. And what you need is citizen commitment to undertaking that voyage um, together. Now I want to talk very briefly and finish by talking about the evolving structure of the global economy. We are at a crossroads in a process that began 300 years ago with the British Industrial Revolution. For 200 years after 1750, 15% of the world's population took off. It's the group that we now call, the people who now live in the group we call the advanced countries. And everybody else stayed right where they were, approximately, plus or minus. And so if you looked at the inequality in the world, in 1950, 10% of it was accounted for by inter-country differences. And by 1950, because of this divergent pattern, that number, inter-country, you know, inequality explained by inter-country differences had risen to 60 to 70%. We are now in a different century, the dynamics of which are not divergence but convergence. It is very hard to see at the start. But what happened after World War II, essentially, is that the other 85% of the world's population joined the party, slowly, with lots of false starts. And we're halfway through that century, a bit more, and those economies are becoming big. Uh, they can now sustain their own growth even if we slow down, we believe. They are richer, and from our point of view, that is Israel's, Europe's, the United States, and Japan, the supply side of their economies is moving up the, supply, the value added chain. They are doing more and more things that are like what we do. Uh, and that means we have to think about, as part of the long term strategy for an economy, where are our areas of comparative advantage going to be? What is the structure of our economy going to look like? Where are the jobs going to look like? So I'm going to skip ahead now and show you something that I just did with respect to the American economy. And I think I have an agreement with the McKinsey Global Institute to do this on a much larger set of countries. So I just share this with you to show you what I mean concretely by thinking carefully about the evolving structure of the global economy. My research assistant and I took the data on the American economy and a methodology developed for deciding what parts of the economy are in the, in the internationally or globally tradable sector and what parts aren't. Right? You think normally of exports and imports, but the underlying concept is can this thing be traded, meaning produced in one place and consumed in another, or is it a domestic activity? What's a domestic activity? Government, construction for the most part, hotels and restaurants, healthcare for the most part, right? There's always an exception, and we could sit here and debate about it, but. So that's the division, tradable and non-tradable. In the last two decades, the United States created 27 million jobs, and almost all of them were in the non-tradable sector. This is the pattern of size and job creation. The tradable sectors 
you know, maybe a third of the economy, but flat. If you look at what's inside the tradable sector that has decomposed this, in terms of industries, there's five very large sources of employment in the American economy on the non-tradable side. And they are government at 22 plus million, healthcare, which went from 10 to 16 million, retail, hotels, restaurants, and food service, and construction, with a bit of a downturn coming into the crisis. Healthcare and government added 10 million of the 27 million jobs, all by themselves, 40%. Now, I think if you're planning sort of, or thinking about the future of American employment, and what's going to happen to the middle class, you have to ask yourself the question, is this pattern going to be sustainable in the future? And if not, where is the job creation going to come from? Again, I don't want to go on a great length about this, but we did this essentially for all of the um, tradable and non-tradable sectors. This happens to be the tradable sector, and some of you might find it entertaining to look at this later on. The pattern, however, is not replicated on the value-added side. Value-added is roughly the value of the output of the firm or industry minus what they purchase by way of inputs, energy, raw materials, and so on. Turns out the tradable and non-tradable sectors in value-added grew about the same amount. And so if you look at the value-added per person employed, in these two sectors, what's happened, in this economy anyway, and I don't think this is general, that's why we want to do it for a whole bunch of economies, is that the value added per person employed is rocketing up in the, in the tradable sector, and most of the employment is going into the non-tradable sector where value added and incomes are rising relatively slowly. What I've just described to you is consistent with the rather unfortunate evolution of the income distribution in the United States. What's happening behind this? The global economy, and in particular the emerging markets, coming up the value-added chain, are taking more and more chunks of the tradable sector out. So the jobs are being taken away, and then what's left is tremendous value-added in managing multinational enterprises, computer design, lots of technology, and so on, right? And the people who work there are doing just fine. They're actually wildly enthusiastic about the global economy, but the other folks aren't. And so far, we don't have a plan to figure out where the employment is going to come from for a good chunk of our fellow citizens. So I say this not to... Not to make it in any sense definitive. I actually don't know what the solution to this is. I think it will take a kind of, you know, a set of discussions of the type you're about to have, only in a different country. But the point I'm trying to make is that part of thinking about the future economy is being knowledgeable about the evolution of your own economy structure and knowledgeable about the evolution of the global economy structure and the interaction of those two things. Thank you very much.